Good evening. It is a little bit past seven, so a very warm welcome from Blockchain Lab Drenthe. My name is Adri Wisman, and um, I will be uh, your host for this evening. Uh, for those who do not know Blockchain Lab Drenthe, I will have a short introduction. Let me get my presentation like this. Um, now, Blockchain Lab Drenthe is a non-profit foundation uh, with the goal to spread knowledge. Let me put some sound off here and next to me. Otherwise, you will hear a lot of noise like this. Okay, uh, Blockchain Lab Drenthe is a non-profit foundation uh, with the goal to spread knowledge, experience and insights about distributed ledger technology and blockchain amongst entrepreneurs, um, uh, schools, governmental bodies, students and private persons and we do that by organizing these monthly meetups uh, but also by lecturing blockchain at the University of Applied Sciences uh, doing feasibility studies and all kinds of fun blockchain projects now um, you saw it in this screen um, we are part of Interreg project bling and bling stands for blockchain in government and uh, the Interreg project bling is a European program with uh, six North Sea region countries and 14 partners uh, who are all working on a blockchain for public services. Uh, uh, partners include the city of Groningen, the province of Drenthe, uh, the municipality of Emmen here in Holland, but also Göteborg University, Oldenburg University, Edinburgh University, um, the city of Antwerp, Gent, Roeselare, Ho West, etc. So lots of uh, international partners who are all working in the field of blockchain. Not only us. Um, let me go to the next slide. Where is my presentation? Like this. Now, um, this is YouTube and YouTube is a pretty one-way street. Uh, you can see me, but I cannot see you. But there is a way to communicate uh, with the studio here uh, by using the chat window next to our uh, video uh, window. So um, uh, if you have any questions, if you have any remarks, uh, if you would like to introduce yourself, then please use uh, the, the chat window and uh, uh, I can read the, the questions and try to answer them. Um, so um, let's see what we have on the agenda for this evening. We have a, a, a very nice uh, uh, few speakers. Uh, uh, we always have a format of um, uh, three topics. Uh, the first topic being um, uh, what's going on in the blockchain space. And there's always a lot going on. So um, uh, I have some news on tech, on scams, on, on price action. Um, then uh, our second speaker of the night is uh, uh, Victor van der Hulst. And he is the coalition manager, uh, the, the, the manager of the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. And he will tell you all about uh, um, that foundation and what they are doing and, and how they are supporting the decentralization of digital infrastructure in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, then uh, the third speaker is Jeroen Wester. And uh, uh, Jeroen Wester is going to talk about MetaMask uh, this, this time. And MetaMask is being used by lots and lots of people who are in the blockchain space. And um, it's, it's um, a, a piece of standard software. Well, uh, Jeroen uh, did a bit of a, a diving into the subject. Uh, so he, he's coming to tell you what MetaMask uh, is, what it does, and uh, where to look out for, because scammers are using uh, MetaMask also. And he will have some hints and tips for you how to stay safe with uh, MetaMask. Um, I also have to uh, also already announce our next meetup, which is on March 23rd. So exactly uh, in four weeks. And um, um, we'll be having uh, 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 different uh, topics and different speakers. I'm, I'm part of furniture here. 
So um, uh, what's going on in the blockchain space is always uh, in, in this uh, format. Okay, um, then without further ado, uh, let's dive in to uh, our first segment, uh, which is called what is going on in the blockchain space. And we always start with some price action, right? Uh, because more or less, uh, uh, most people start with buying some coins and getting interested in the blockchain space. And we here at Blockchain Lab Drenthe are not really deeply interested in, in the currencies, the cryptocurrencies. Um, but they are the biggest application of blockchain. And that's why we start with it. Uh, but there are lots and lots of beautiful different um, applications which are deployed on the blockchain uh, nowadays. Um, first, some price action. So this is a picture of uh, this afternoon uh, where we see uh, Bitcoin at um, around 24,000 uh, US dollars uh, and uh, Ethereum uh, around uh, 1,600, uh, 40, 50, etc. And, and the top 10 of the cryptocurrencies, according to market cap, uh, where is the most money invested in which coins, uh, didn't uh, uh, change a lot when uh, we would compare it to last month. Only the last four or something, uh, they are still there, but they're now and then changing uh, how they are um, uh, on the list. But uh, they are uh, more or less uh, always in the top 10. Now, most of the uh, cryptocurrencies, you can see that at the end of the lines, are uh, in the red for the last few days already. Uh, they're going down a little bit. Uh, the, the, the market uh, is in a modus where it's, it's being indecisive. We'll look at some charts uh, in a moment where um, is Bitcoin going to go through the 25,000? Yes or no? Uh, so that's um, a, a big, a very big question. So everybody's a little bit apprehensive. Um, my clicker used to work. Yes, so uh, Bitcoin uh, this afternoon of this morning was at 24,400, while at the 1st of January, it was only 16,650. Uh, and, and the same uh, for um, Ethereum, uh, at the 1st of January, it was only 1,200, which means there are massive gains. Uh, um, crypto investors are smiling ear to ear. Uh, Bitcoin has risen. Um, nearly 50%, uh, 46.6, and uh, that is a, a very significant. Uh, Ethereum has gone up uh, uh, nearly 39%, and since our last meetup, because it was already uh, a lot up, uh, Bitcoin has risen 6.5% uh, and Ethereum 5.6%. Those are uh, uh, ginormous uh, figures. Um, uh, do not compare them with what you get at the bank. Okay, the risk profile might be a little bit different, but uh, for speculators who know what they're doing, this is, uh, this is paradise. Here we see what uh, Bitcoin did since the 1st of January. And there we see the first run up and we were around there um, at uh, our last uh, meetup. Uh, it, it corrected a little bit uh, down to 21,500 and it went up. So it got up to nearly 25,000 uh, and it bounced back. So at the moment, like I said, it's a bit indecisive. Will it go under 23,500? That's a major support line. Or even may, maybe it will slip under 22,500. Then people are getting nervous. Uh, and if it goes under the, those 21,500, uh, which is the, the major dip we see there, and then I think a lot of people are going to take their profits uh, on, on the last months and uh, stepping uh, out of the market, which might trigger an even bigger uh, um, losing streak for uh, Bitcoin. But for now, we are in an uptrend. Right? As, as long as we stay above that uh, uh, little valley you see on the screen, then the uptrend is intact. Now here we see uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum compare to each other. And, and since the 1st of January, uh, Bitcoin has been outperforming uh, Ethereum a, a little bit. Uh, uh, but um, in the last few weeks, as you can see there at the right hand top, 
uh, there they are uh, exactly in, in overlay modus. So uh, they are exactly the same. Investors in general uh, do not prefer ethers uh, uh, over bitcoins and uh, or vice versa. So uh, they are more or less at par. Um, last time I talked about uh, if you want a job in crypto, then uh, the Bank of England uh, is looking for a head of uh, uh, central bank digital currencies. Uh, they they uh, wrote out a, an ad to uh, attract uh, a, a new director uh, for this job. Uh, although they are still a little bit um, uh, on the fence, are we going to go with CBDCs or not? Right? Uh, in Europe, we don't have a choice. They're, they're working on the digital euro and uh, the Netherlands is also uh, included in that. But yeah, well, um, UK isn't Europe anymore, so they have to look after th themselves. Now, um, this is a pretty uh, nice and popular job, and it shows that they are working on uh, central bank digital currencies. Now, here you see an ad that's been there for a, a few days now uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. So, United States is also looking for uh, a central bank digital currency expert to help them set things up. So. I think things are picking up and, and um, you'll see in, in other slides uh, uh, the same topic uh, reoccur. Uh, so if you're looking for a job and you want to really make an impact in the central bank digital currencies, go for it. Um, now I hope they get somebody a little bit more knowledgeable than this guy. This is a, a state senator, uh, Robert Peters, and um, um, he certainly doesn't know much about blockchain since um, he passed a bill on the uh, February the 9th. Um, it was a bit bit sneaky. Um, uh, the, the state of Illinois uh, passed a bill uh, 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 which was initiated by him where a judge can uh, rule that miners have to roll back transactions. Now, I don't know if, uh, if you know about immutability in the blockchain, they are somewhat interconnected. No, they are the, the, the bread and butter of blockchain. So it is impossible. A judge can order what he wants, but it is impossible for a miner to roll back the transaction. And he didn't state you have to annul the transaction. You have to do uh, the opposite transaction again to, to uh, have a zero effect. No, they really said we want you to roll back to take this transaction out of the previous blocks. That's impossible. So um, uh, if, if this, uh, uh, this bill stays uh, in Illinois as a uh, past law, then I see a lot of uh, miners uh, leaving the state of Illinois because they can and will not uh, comply to this bill by uh, Senator Robert Peters. It, it is technically impossible to do so. Let's, um, let's uh, hope there are a little bit more knowledgeable people uh, uh, that are going to, to correct this uh, omission. Um, now I talked about England and CBDCs and, and uh, that they are a bit sneaky working on it. Well, there are also people working against it. So there is uh, the, the Council for uh, Tax Reform and they are starting uh, what some people call a crusade against the digital uh, British pound uh, because of privacy. Um, they see it as a surveillance vehicle for the, the government uh, to, to uh, see where you're spending your money and how and etc. So um, they are against it and um, uh, opposing everything that has to do with uh, CBDCs, and that is a bit against the trend. Uh, I, I don't think they will uh, succeed. I think uh, the UK will have its own CBDCs. The, the, the impact of a CBDC is too big to let it slide and to let the rest of the world just do it uh, uh, without the UK. And we can see that because um, lots of, of countries are already working on CBDCs and are in an in a further state than we are in Europe, right? Russia is going to roll out the uh, pilot 
uh, with their CBDC in April. And Japan is going to roll out in, in April also, right? Before May, April. So in Cambodia, they are doing a proof of concept. And in India, they are already working with CBDCs in five or seven big cities. Now, in fact, 16 of the G20 countries, uh, which are the, the, the 19 biggest countries and Europe as a bloc, 16 of those 20 are already developing CBDCs and are in, in the pet pilot stage, so to say. So yeah, uh, uh, it is really picking up. People are really uh, motivated to, to make their own currencies and um, trying to be on the front of the wave. There are uh, big uh, stakes um, when a country, a large country like China, India, you name them, have their own CBDCs that could mean something for the US dollar, which is uh, uh, all over the world as a reserve currency, right? And when you have a digital currency of the country itself, it would probably be negative for users of the dollar. It wouldn't be that current anymore. On a much lighter side, uh, uh, here you see <coughs> uh, Spotify is also entering the Web3 space and Spotify is um, connecting their platform with your Web3 wallet. They are already uh, experimenting with that in a few countries. Um, so that when you have NFTs, which are sold by uh, a musician, or in this case, uh, there is a, a game uh, developer, this NFT will communicate with your Spotify account and unlock certain music and playlists, etc. So uh, Spotify is entering the, the Web3 arena and uh, slowly but surely more and more companies are connecting to Web3. Now, this doesn't work for iOS yet. It only works for Android, but uh, you can see where this is moving to. Um, this is something uh, which is also uh, very special. You all know NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And an NFT is nothing more than a smart contract on the Ethereum uh, uh, chain. Uh, which is uh, connected to your name, your account, right? It is non-fungible. Um, now, the, the, the artwork connected to that NFT is never stored on the Ethereum chain. It is stored on IPFS, uh, the Interplanetary File System. And um, uh, now there is something special happening. Since the last Bitcoin uh, software update, uh, uh, which was uh, called Taproot, uh, the, the blocks, uh, the, the Bitcoin data blocks have a little bit of space where you can inscribe, where you can put some data into your transaction. It's, it's an ordinal field. And um, uh, a, a number of programmers uh, used that space to store pictures like that. And, and you know all... Uh, uh, the, the, the first NFTs were punks and apes and etc. So now you can have NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain. But the biggest difference is that the information is stored in the block itself. So on the chain, not like on Ethereum, where the information is stored somewhere else and there's only a hash, a link to um, uh, where the, the media is. Uh, on IPFS, no, this information is stored within the blocks uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so it's bloating up a little bit of the chain, uh, the, the size of the, the blockchain. Now here you can see that the average size of the blocks used to be 1.1 megabyte or something. And you can see very clearly when this happened, uh, the block size uh, doubled uh, because uh, NFT information, uh, pictures were being stored on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, now, at first, the miners were a little bit against it. They didn't like uh, the bigger size, etc. But now they found out that they can uh, earn money with it. And since uh, the, the few weeks that it's been going on, the, uh, the miners uh, earned about six hundred, seven hundred thousand uh, uh, dollars uh, just by processing these NFTs on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's new. Uh, uh, ordinal NFTs, 
but uh, you can see um, uh, that uh, with every update, there are people who are exploring the possibilities and using everything they uh, uh, can use uh, when there is space in, in a block. Um, then we come to the, the segment scams. Uh, uh, we always have a segment uh, which uh, talks about scams, not because we like scams, but more to warn you. Uh, like, like Jeroen Wester is going to warn you later on uh, about uh, MetaMask. Um, here you see uh, uh, something else uh, Jeroen talked about. Uh, last month he talked about chat GPT and blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence. He's our, he's our um, uh, artificial intelligence expert on duty, so to speak. So um, uh, everybody has noticed that chat GPT has exploded. Everybody is talking about it, everybody wants to use it, and Microsoft has put in a lot of money, I believe uh, a little bit over 10 billion dollars into ChatGPT to use it in their search engine Bing. Now, where lots of commotion is, where lots of people are talking about a new hype, scammers see an opportunity. So there are these scammers which mining uh, their Bing ChatGPT coin. And approaching people, this is your way to invest in ChatGPT Bing and uh, um, uh, do this now and make a lot of money. Um, but you probably know what's going on. It's a pump and dump scheme where they pump the cores up and buy uh, stuff themselves. And when the price is at its peak, they sell all their coins. Uh, so uh, the rest of the people will be left with no zilch nothing so um, there there has been uh, this uh, agency which has been uh, looking at them uh, and, and observing them and their behavior and so they outed them as uh, yeah scammers uh, there is no currency there is no coin called uh, Bing chat GPT that is connected really connected to the real thing to Microsoft Bing and chat GPT so uh, beware that's why we're we're talking about this in our scam segment. Um, Chainalysis uh, came out with a report last week uh, where they stated that um, ab about 50% lower uh, revenues for scammers in 2022. So 46% uh, lower revenue. Um, that is a, a big number. That does not mean that uh, there are less scammers. No, no, there are even more scammers than in 2021. Uh, but the price went down. Uh, the, the currency price, the coin prices went down. So that is responsible for uh, taking out half of their value. Um, uh, so don't pity the scammers. Uh, uh, it's still rising. You still have to be aware of what you're doing. And they state also that of all the scams that they uh, see on, on chain, that there are two, the biggest ones, that's the, the romance scam and the giveaway scams. Uh, the romance scams is where you, you get approached by um, uh, 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 women and men that have a story and, and uh, want you to fall in love with them and send them money because they have a sick parents or a sick sister or whatever and they scam you out of your money by sending it um, and the giveaway scam is uh, you won a prize right you you have had the mails uh, probably also pouring into your mailbox uh, of um, uh, people uh, uh, who are going to give you a prize or you um, uh, are entitled to have money from a dead person being transferred from you to you or a, a, a Nigerian prince uh, that uh, wants to send you money or whatever. Those two scams are still the biggest ones, right? So ransomware aside, etc. most people are going for these simple things. Uh, um, one would say that people would have learned in the meantime, nah, nah, absolutely not. So be aware. Um, last thing before uh, we end this segment, um, uh, um, we were in a podcast uh, talking about Blockchain Lab uh, Drenthe 
uh, talking about energy knip, the future, etc. Different kind of applications. Uh, the deployments we already did. Uh, it's on Spotify, so if you after this live stream still want to hear my voice, then go to Spotify and go to uh, the Monaco um, podcasts and uh, find this uh, episode 61 where I'll be uh, talking into your ears for, uh, I believe, 50 minutes or something. Uh, but it was a lot of fun and uh, there's a lot of information in there. So uh, that concludes uh, this segment. I didn't see uh, any uh, questions. Um, I see uh, uh, some people in the chat um, uh, saying hello to me. And um, um, let's go to the next segment where uh, Victor from the Dutch Blockchain Coalition is going uh, to present. The next segment is the, about the uh, foremost organization uh, uh, in relation to blockchain in the Netherlands, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. Uh, they have stakeholders from government to private organizations and uh, uh, we are very privileged to have the coalition manager present in our live stream. So I'm going to put him on screen for now. Hello, Victor. Hi, Adrie. Um, uh, like I said, it's a privilege to have you here and uh, you are going to enlighten us uh, about uh, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. So um, uh, I'll let you do your introduction uh, by yourself because uh, you're much more capable uh, at that than I, uh, <laughs> I can ever be. So I'm going to put you on the big screen and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Adri, and uh, thanks for having me, actually, and very exciting. And uh, also to be here at, yeah, at your webinar um, related to Blink, so blockchain and government. Yeah, one of our focus areas, of course, within the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. And maybe uh, you also recognize it in our slogan, Blockchain for Good. Um, maybe also good to mention that last year, uh, Blockchain Lab Drenthe, of course, also became a regional hub for the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. Uh, Coalition. So. I would say many reasons to uh, participate here today in your uh, in your meetup. Um, let me first introduce myself. My name is Victor van der Gulst. I'm the coalition manager or managing director of the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. And maybe some of you recognize me as the former program manager of Spark Living Lab, uh, a research project that explored the application of blockchain technology and also other um, technology like IoT in uh, supply chain and logistics. And that project has ended uh, already and as of the 1st of January, I took over the role of coalition, coalition manager from um, uh, Peter Verkoelen. So let's start with the, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. Um, so let me briefly introduce you why we started, what was it, five years ago as a coalition. Because um, in today's world, the prevalence of fake news, data leaks, supply chains, uh, disruptions has highlighted the importance of inclusive, verifiable and robust digital systems that can also remain um, flexible and agile. So decentralization is a key feature of these systems and especially as they grow more complex. So fortunately, as you all know, blockchain technology enables a decentralized organization of digital systems uh, at a larger scale. So when it, it is widely recognized that centrally organized digital services, especially of large tech companies, often operates as uh, monopolies and fall short on transparency and uh, democratic participation. So decentralized digital systems, on the other hand, offer an alternative that is more transparent and democratic which all of our viewers, I suppose, will recognize. So the decentralization of digital systems, also known as Web3, is crucial. Is a crucial foundation for scalable cooperation in complex issues such as um, energy transition, sustainable supply chains, safety, mobility, and to name a few. So this makes decentralized organization of digital systems they're desirable in many cases, and blockchain plays a critical role in enabling this. So hence, our vision is that decentralization of digital system systems is a logical next step 
in the digitalization of our society. So nothing new so far, probably. So that brings us to, oh, <laughs> to the, uh, to the Dutch blockchain coalition. So we, as the Dutch blockchain coalition are a public private partnership with more or less 60 partners. And we were founded almost five years ago. So what do we do? We take a proactive and facilitative role in supporting our partners to achieve our joint mission. Meaning that in addition to provide clarification and direction, we enable interaction and always striving to achieve real world results. That's important, I would say. So our mission is to increase awareness and knowledge about blockchain and more like IoT and so, and accelerate the decentralization of digital infrastructure in the, Netherlands, in the Netherlands and abroad, also on the European level. So we focus on key social and economic themes, as you can see on the screen, which can be continuously refined in terms of content through our yeah, governance structure. And um, in addition, we are dedicated to the new and ongoing development of essential building blocks, including those cut across multiple themes, such as uh, crypto economic, uh, self-sovereign identity, scaling, of course, standardization, and the human capital agenda and challenges. So focus on talent development as well. So let's highlight on one of our focus areas, SSI. It's also in bold on the screen. So the digital identity is of course crucial for a digital society because it enables individuals to interact and transact in a digital world with trust and security. So it makes sense, of course, that we prefer a decentralized architecture also known as the self-sovereign identity. So SSI is also a solution that requires broad adoption. Adoption by issuers, governments, banks, and other trusted parties, verifiers, and those who need to verify an identity or a specific claim. Think about hotels or retailers, car rentals, uh, financial institutions, and so on. And the holders, so we, people, companies, but maybe also things and devices. So SSI is one of our core topics that we are working on um, today. So, and what we see today is especially a maturing technology and therefore also better cases. So if we have a look at, um, at our yeah, evolution, um, it started almost six years ago. First, with bringing together the ecosystem, mapping uh, potential of blockchain and DOT, and a lot of learning and discovery. And in the next phase, we focus more on use cases. So we developed quite some use cases to, to, together with our partners, public and private, and also knowledge institutions. And we learned a lot. What works and also what doesn't work. And right now we are in a phase of yeah, further development, further developing the foundation for yeah, sustainable innovation and collaboration. We believe the technology is there. It's now more about adoption and actual using the technology. And keep in mind, blockchain solutions are inherently yeah, cross-border in nature and um, uh, also at the organizational level. So it requires collaboration across multiple organizations, which makes it even harder to get it adopted. It's it, 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 therefore it's quite different from other uh, technologies that you want to adopt. So given the legal and uh, regulatory framework yeah, surrounding blockchain technology and also the societal impact of blockchain applications, yeah, there is a strong connection with the government. So that's also a link between uh, your project and, uh, and our work, of course. So now besides the building blocks, we are currently working on uh, working with dedicated teams of stakeholders um, on various, various relevant use cases. Um, so to name a few, to give you an idea what we are working on, 
um, renew renewable fuels. Very important that these fuels can be tracked from their origin to end user to an application. Um, and that application uses decentralized infrastructure to efficiently collect, aggregate, and visualize sustainability information throughout the chain, of course, about these fuels, all in a reliable and verifiable manner. And currently, solutions don't exist yet and require a neutral party, us, to get the ball rolling, as some of the involved companies are actual competitors. So this is a very important um, uh, use case we are currently working on. The next one, uh, as an example, the company passport, which is, of course, directly linked to self-sovereign identity. So we are exploring right now with a, a group of stakeholders, governmental parties and private parties as well, how a company passport can streamline the registration process and also acting in the core of trading. So the existing processes are being further digitized using self-sovereign identity and blockchain technology. Um, with one goal, register a company within one day, fully digital. Third one is about compliance by design. You will recognize this, I think, because uh, some of your cases are also yeah, linked to this uh, to this topic. So this is a large net, a nationwide uh, program, which allows legally compliant, accessible and explainable e-services to be created to members or for members of the public and companies. So in essence, we are developing a system that ensures compliance with laws and regulations such as the um, uh, Environment Act or the Debt Relief Act in Dutch Omgevingswet and the Wet Schulpeulplaning by automating the relevant processes through executable rules, of course, again, using decentralized technologies. This use case is similarities with the work you're already doing, uh, as I already mentioned. So the, th the, the last one, the fourth one, is the Electronic Bill of Lading. So that's more related to supply chains because bills of lading are one of the three crucial documents used in international trade. And they ensure that exporters receive payment and importers receive the goods. And it's a negotiable document, which means it is tradable and it serves as a document of title to the goods. So the ultimate goal of this project is, is to establish a fully digital and legally recognized transfer of ownership by creating a tradable bill of lading. And again, and also automating the required document flow and financing of the underlying commodities. The aim is to eliminate paper-based processes entirely in global trade. Technically succeeded, in a pilot together with the Port of Rotterdam and, uh, and Doc Lab, one of our partners, and um, the, the Port of Singapore. And now only the law holds back further uh, adoption. And the Netherlands is about to change its civil code, which is required here. So EBLs, Electronic Bill of Ladings, will have the legal equivalent yeah, with the paper document. So if you want to know more information about these use cases, Please look at our website. You can uh, you can find it all there, and uh, or maybe contact um, one of our team leads and um, and have a talk about it. So finally, we focus on three core tasks because the DBC, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition, serves as a hub for governmental bodies, commercial sector. Um, centers of expertise that are interested in the decentralized organization of digital infrastructure and services, as I just uh, explained, explained. So our coalition provides opportunities for various stakeholders to collaborate on research, set a strategic agenda, uh, develop and skill use cases, and exchange knowledge and expertise. Um, still growing, and if you are interested, please contact us and, uh, and, and, and join. Um, to um, yeah, to to increase the movement. 
And again, also our coalition strives to develop blockchain talent in the Netherlands. I think that's also really important. And in addition to our ongoing efforts, we are proactively seeking to create a shared vision for the future of blockchain technologies in the Netherlands and in Europe. So also think about the European blockchain services infrastructure, European blockchain partnership, and so on. A lot is going on on that level. And to achieve this goal, we will engage in dialogue with policy makers, industry leaders, politicians, and so on. So we will work with our partners to develop a vision within the key focus areas and those critical building blocks. Again, think about SSI. So finally, uh, our focus is on use cases, so just explained, that have a tangible impact on the teams and on, on our overarching mission to expediting the implementation of decentralized digital systems. So that was my introduction about the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. Uh, thanks for letting me introduce it. And yeah, if you want to, learn, to have more information, please visit our website. Um, we are open for, uh, for other companies and public institutions to join. Do not hesitate to contact us. And, uh, and please also keep an eye on our website for our upcoming events and especially our big trends in, uh, in June. Uh, more information will follow uh, soon. Thank you, Adri. Okay. Great, uh, absolutely uh, uh, great to hear about all the stakeholders. I mean, you are talking to so many uh, organizations and, and governmental departments uh, um, th that, that instills a lot of hope in my heart because we've been <laughs> pushing the boundaries of technology uh, 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 the last uh, six, seven years. And um, uh, it, it's good to see that you are uh, doing this on such a broad spectrum. Um, I've got a question for you. Um, um, uh, you mentioned a number of use cases, uh, the electronic bill of lighting, um, yeah. uh, the, the, the company passport, etc. Um, how, much, how much time do you think it will take uh, to, to uh, get that deployed and, and becoming mainstream? Is that five years? Is that six years? Is that two years? Uh, that depends a little bit on the use case. Okay? Um, for example, the electronic bill of lighting, uh, technically it's, it's already there. It depends on the, on the change in the civil, civil code. Um, that is scheduled later this year. So hopefully at the end of this year, we can really start yeah, working with an electronic bill of lading in global trade. Um, it will start small, of course, um, mainly in Port of Rotterdam and Singapore, but then hopefully it will be uh, adopted by uh, um, way more uh, ports and, uh, and, uh, and, comp and companies uh, to get it really adopted. Uh, the other ones um, will, will, will take a little bit more time, especially the company passport that's still in its, um, in its early phase. A lot has to be done. Um, so realistically, I would say two, three years uh, at least it will take uh, to, uh, to get it adopted. Ah, two, three years is, is good. I mean, I was thinking five, six, seven years. So uh, uh, you are uh, uh, even uh, being more optimistic than I. I, I mean, yeah. um, I've, I've got some experience uh, with uh, uh, rules, regulations and laws that sometimes have to be changed to implement uh, this technology. And um, um, well, uh, the, the cog wheels of the government are turning slow. <laughs> and uh, so- Yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's very um, hard to get these changes really uh, uh, on the ground and deployed. Great. Yeah, I, well, I, I, um, agree. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, uh, great to hear uh, of all these developments. Um, um, I will keep um, uh, the, the people uh, watching uh, also in the next month uh, informed about your conference uh, for, uh, the, uh, if they want to, uh, to join that. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, your uh, uh, beautiful introduction of the Dutch Blockchain uh, Coalition. And um, uh, I will uh, uh, put the link to your website uh, on screen uh, later on. Thank you very much, Victor. Thanks for having me, Adri. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't see any specific questions about the Dutch Blockchain Coalition. So we'll just uh, move on. I I've put the link to uh, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition website in the chat and also in the remarks of the video. 
So uh, if you want to see what they are doing, uh, uh, please uh, inform yourself. And, and uh, there is also information about the, the conference uh, that they are going to do uh, this summer. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, Jeroen and his talk about MetaMask. And um, uh, I'll, I'll be back uh, afterwards. My name is Jeroen Wester and today's talk will be on MetaMask. We will cover a few topics. Oh, um, what does it do? How does it work? A few risks and scams and then a few tips to take away. So let's start with oh, what does it do? What is MetaMask? MetaMask is a tool installed on your computer um, that uh, manages your digital assets. It's, it, it manages your tokens, your coins. It can also work as a token exchange, so you convert between, for instance, Ether and Ether-based tokens. But it's very important to understand that uh, MetaMask is a um, self-custodial wallet. You are in control of your assets, of course, it's your wallet, but that's not all. The th um, you're also in control of your password and your keys stored in your wallet. And in the case that you have lost access to your MetaMask wallet, you are in deep trouble, but there is no organization that can help you in order to recover your access to the tool. In essence, it has four functions. It's a key uh, vault. It stores your keys. Um, it provides you a secure login. Um, it's a token wallet and a token exchange. And it comes in two uh, different flavors. You can install it as an independent app on your computer or as a browser extension in all the um, um, major browsers. Okay. Um, but let's uh, um, let's see what's what, what's actually in there in a, in a blockchain wallet. It's important to understand that in a normal wallet, um, in, that's in the picture here, uh, you have money. Uh, and your cards, of course, um, the cards, you could see them as keys and the wallet is real money. You can take it out and you make a payment there. In a blockchain wallet, it's a little bit different because there are not actually coins in the wallet. Um, it's the storage of keys and the keys you need to have, um, you need to have them in order to do something on the blockchain. So important to understand that the blockchain wallet contains your keys and not your coins. Your coins are stored somewhere in the blockchain network. Um, another misconception is that you need your wallet in order to see how much tokens or how much Ether you have. That's also not the case. You can see how much Ether there is on a certain address and everyone can see that. You can use tools like Etherscan to see how much coins are there on a specific address. In this case, 0.2 Ether on a certain address. It's all test money, so you, you cannot go there to, oh, you can probably go there to the address. You have to, to uh, copy that address to see it. So you don't need your wallet to see your balance. You can go to a block explorer to see uh, how much coins there are. Uh, uh, um, uh, you can say, okay, oh, wow, that's strange. Nobody can look into my real wallet, my real world wallet to see how much money there's there, but that's a different situation in a blockchain network. Most blockchains are transparent and this transparency is not annoying, it's important. It's the base, it's the keystone of the whole thing. There's trust and, and trust is built by being transparent. People can check if things are really the way that they should be. Okay, then another thing. Um, where does MetaMask store your keys? Well, these keys are not stored on the blockchain, like your ether is stored on the blockchain. No. These keys, they are stored uh, in MetaMask itself. So if you install the app, the keys are stored in the app. And if you s use a browser extension, then the keys are stored somewhere in the browser or in this browser extension. That might raise a trust issue. Can, can you trust the app that stores your key, in this case MetaMask? Maybe you can, but is it really the app from MetaMask that you installed there? 
that could be a trust issue. And the other thing is, can you trust the browser? Isn't there some secret code that would send your keys to uh, an untrusted party that would, uh, and would steal all your ethers? So if you think it's not safe enough, MetaMask is also capable of working with an uh, external key store. So you can connect that external key store to your computer. You can do transactions with MetaMask and MetaMask uses the key that's stored in that external key store. Of course, you have to trust the external key store. There are also scams in that uh, area. Okay, how does this work? Um, uh, yeah, um, so it's very simple. Uh, you first, you start uh, by installing the app and a browser extension. You create a wallet or you import an existing one. Um, when you, ins when you uh, install an existing one, you need to know your secret recovery phrase. This is, these words come from MetaMask. Uh, other people would say, oh, you need, to, uh, you need to have your seed, the seed that you created when you created a wallet. Um, so um, when, you, um, uh, when you import, when you use that uh, secret recovery phrase, then you can regenerate um, your wallet on your computer and you can see the balance. You can do the transactions with the keys that are connected to this secret recovery phrase. So very important to, when you have this, uh, when you generated a new secret recovery phrase is that you store it in a safe place because you need it to recover your wallet or to install it in a, on another device. So remember, this is self-custodial. You are in charge of everything. Okay, when you have created a wallet, well, you need to add some funds to your wallet. In this case, I uh, added some uh, test ether to my wallet from a uh, girly, a faucet. You can go check, look that up on the internet. You can see that you can get some testing money there. And you see that I have a 0.19481 girly ethers in my wallet. Now that I have money in my wallet, I can send it to another wallet. Well, that is a very simple flow. Um, you select a receiver. Um, uh, selecting a receiver is actually selecting uh, the public address of the wallet of that receiver. Simple. Um, you can list uh, receivers in, in, in the wallet and you can select one or you can copy the public address somewhere from the internet and paste that into your, to your wallet when you want to send some money. And um, then you choose an amount of um, uh, asset or funds or ethers that you would like to send. You press send and you wait for a confirmation. In the third step, you can see also the amount of gas that is needed to, to confirm this transaction. Um, and that's that. It's very simple straightforward. There's also another thing that you can do. You can also use a MetaMask for swapping. So, so you have tokens in one sort and you can swap them to tokens in a different sort. Um, so maybe MetaMask is also a bit of a competitor for exchanges because you can also do that there. Um, um, I don't know. I didn't make a comparison to see if it was cheaper to uh, to swap tokens with MetaMask in relation to swapping tokens on an exchange. Okay, then a big one. Um, are there any risks and are there scams? Um, oh, yes, there are. Let's start with the first one. Um, when you, um, we talked about self-custodial, about trust, uh, um, but it's important to know, uh, to understand if you are really anonymous when you do uh, MetaMask based transactions. And it looks that f in general you are. Um, MetaMask does not have your email address. It does not have your account, uh, your, your name uh, or your password. Everything takes place in, on your computer. So from that perspective, 
it's it it fits the general blockchain architecture of decentralization distribution um, uh, and that's cool but now a few months ago uh, there were words that in certain specific situations metamask starts collecting ip addresses of people doing transactions and there has been the community responded mainly negative that's not so very strange that they responded negative because the basic idea of this whole community is to do thinking uh, to be on your own anonymous trustworthy and then you cannot have a company collecting ip addresses of people doing transactions with the tools that are provided within this community um, why do they do that that's interesting i think and i didn't dive in very deep but i can see two reasons why they do that um, one could be a business reason so metamask how is this funded um, uh, probably by gifts or by uh, investors uh, trying to make it as big as possible and then selling the whole thing. When you try to sell something like MetaMask to a big one, um, they need some proof to, about the number of users that do transactions with your tools. So that could be a reason, business reason, to start collecting IP addresses. The other one could be that um, uh, central banks uh, or uh, uh, national regulations require uh, MetaMask to start building up uh, a, a, key, a KYC policy, something like that. Okay. Food for thought, and uh, I probably need to spend a lot more time to understand it in depth. But be careful. The other thing to be, be careful of is, this is general advice, beware of social engineer. MetaMask is, of, is the largest self-custodial wallet in the space. So a lot of people try to, um, um, try to, to make, uh, tr try to do nasty things, stealing your money. So beware of the social engineer. Stay away from stranger. Don't connect your wallet to suspicious uh, websites. You can connect your wallet to, uh, to websites and you can give them permissions. Uh, check these permissions uh, and remove websites that you do not long, longer want to connect to. Um, and this is general advice, of course, again. Um, the, uh, the second one is uh, don't be fish. So um, MetaMask does not have your email address. So when you receive an email from MetaMask, or you think it comes from MetaMask, it cannot be true. So don't push any link, uh, click any links, don't read it, just throw it away. Third one, double check identities. People that you might know from the community, are they really the person that you think they are? And especially when they make you super offers like send me all your ether and I will send it back to you and double it. Um, these offers are too good to be true and they probably are too good to be true. So you will lose your money. Okay, then one, keep the MetaMask setup in mind. It is, it uses some words that you might think that they are not the things that you, well, okay, let me explain. Imagine the situation where you have multiple accounts in your MetaMask wallet, like in this uh, screenshot, account one, account two. Then please know that all these accounts are based on the same secret recovery phrase, the same seed. So imagine that you think uh, that uh, your wallet is compromised. Somebody may have access to your wallet. And you think, okay, I have uh, uh, some ether in account one. I think my account, my wallet is compromised. I will send it to account two. Hmm, that might, you can do that. But the person that has access to this wallet has not only access to account one, it also has a, access to account two. So the word account is if confusing here in a meta mask context it means balance or the amount of tokens that are connected to an account to this balance so again when you have one secret recovery phrase for this wallet 
then it will give you access to more accounts. But what do you, what do you need to do when you think your um, uh, access to your wallet is uh, uh, compromised? Well, please create another wallet with a different seed, with a different secret recovery phrase and send the tokens to that wallet, probably on a different device, etc. Okay. Well, and then a very big one, of course. Um, um, uh, there is no help when you, lo when you lost your keys. So situation A, you lost the recovery phrase and your wallet password, bad luck, ether is gone. You will never be capable or to, to, um, to gain access to that wallet. Situation B, you lost your recovery phrase, but you still have access to your wallet. And you are lucky. You can ask your wallet to show your recovery phrase and store it properly then, of course. So be careful. Self-custodial wallets, you are responsible for passwords, seats, and secret recovery phrases. All right. Major takeaways. Major takeaways, super useful tool, not very hard to use. Very simple, very straightforward. Be careful, you might not be as anonymous as you think. And again, beware of the social engineer. They try to make money out of this. Doing these things, these nasty things, probably gives so much rewards for, for the thieves that you, you need to be very careful there. Um, and understand the MetaMask setup before you get hacked so that you understand what you need to do in the case of an alarming situation. And then my last slide. I even found a meme, me waiting for MetaMask confirmation. Yeah, that is a bit of the old days, of course. I don't know how the speed of this, uh, this time in the Ether network, in the Ethereum network. Um, hopefully the proof of stake version of Ethereum does not have this problem of long uh, confirmation times. Um, that was it. Uh, I hope to see you again. Bye bye. Okay, um, um, super informative uh, uh, segment by uh, Jeroen. Um, as Jeroen stated, the, the private keys, uh, the seed of your keys is stored locally. Um, and people might get a hold of it and use it uh, later on to restore your keys and misuse your keys except when you use hardware like this um, the picture uh, uh, that Jeroen showed had also a, a usb uh, key and this is also one this is the, the the ledger so the keys are in this device and they will never leave this device so metastock will ask this device to sign a transaction uh, but the keys will remain here and it will give the signed transaction back and then metamask will uh, work with that so uh, then uh, your keys are much safer than storing them in metamask um, it is impossible to get these keys out there is a mnemonic uh, a, a phrase with 24 um, words that you can uh, use to, whenever you lose, uh, let's say your, your house burns down and uh, you lose your key, as long as you have that uh, mnemonic phrase, you can buy a new ledger, uh, install the phrase in it, and the phrase will generate the, the, the root seed and will restore all your keys, so you can have uh, access to all your accounts and all your coins. Uh, back again so uh, for the investment uh, this is a very very good tool okay let me see if there are any questions i don't see any questions it's very quiet uh, this evening um, then uh, let me go and do the next thing i have to thank uh, victor and Jeroen for um, their uh, very informative uh, segments um, I already put uh, the link to uh, the Dutch Blockchain Coalition in the chat and in the in the uh, notes of uh, YouTube. Uh, then I always have to be a little bit of a of a real YouTuber, so I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, subscribe and press the like button, etc. Because 
it will not cost you anything, but it will help the algorithm to find this video a, a bit better uh, between all these other blockchain um, uh, movies uh, and, and uh, documentaries and uh, uh, clips on YouTube. Uh, so uh, please do. Uh, and like I said, uh, the next meetup will be on March uh, 23rd. Now, I um, uh, don't see any questions uh, uh, anymore. So I wish you a, a very good day and uh, hopefully see you next time. Bye-bye.